High lift devices or flaps are arguably one of the most complex parts of an aircraft's design, and I mean this in two ways. Firstly, the mechanical mechanism for deploying the flaps can be pretty complicated. And secondly, the process of designing the optimal geometry of high lift devices can also be really tricky. For example, you don't want your flaps to be too big since then you'll likely need a really complex deployment mechanism. But on the other hand, you don't want your flaps to be too small because then they won't be able to fulfill their mission. In this video, I'm super excited to show you the results of a small program that I made which takes live data from X-Plane and performs calculations. I've always wanted to be able to do something like this and after some troubleshooting, I've finally been able to sit myself down and implement this. First and for all, let's pick up where we left off in the previous video of the series. So by now we know that the lift equation looks something like this. We know that most of the time lift will equal the weight of the aircraft and that lift is a function of air density, wing area, airspeed and the mysterious lift coefficient. We also know that the lift coefficient is strongly related to angle of attack or alpha. You'll sometimes hear people say that flaps increase lift during the approach. I mean, there's also a reason that they're called high lift devices, of course. I'd like to invite you to imagine what's happening to the airflow around the wing as you deploy flaps. It's pretty obvious that flaps have a tendency to curve the airflow downward. This means that the wing is exerting a force on the air which pushes the air down. And we also know from Newton's third law that every action has an equal and opposite reaction. So if the wing pushes the air down, then the air must be pushing the wing up. And so the more we deflect the air downward, the more lift the wing will produce. Now, if you've seen the previous video, you might have a feeling for what I'm about to say. If we consider the forces on the aircraft during the approach, we know that lift will equal the weight of the aircraft pretty much throughout the flight. This means that when we deploy flaps, ideally we don't want the total lift of the wing to change. But if the high lift devices aren't producing more lift, then what's the point of them? Let's consider what would happen if we reduce the speed of the aircraft without flaps. We can see here in the formula that the lift coefficient, which is more or less equal to angle of attack, will increase until it stalls. At this point, we will have achieved the maximum lift coefficient, or CL max, which corresponds to the stall speed. In this case, the wing stalls around 8 degrees of angle of attack. So if we want to fly slower than this, we're going to need to find a way to increase CL max in this equation to make sure that we produce the same amount of lift as before. The way we do this is by adjusting the lift coefficient. Here we can see a graph of the lift coefficient versus angle of attack for a Cessna 172 in X-Plane. As the aircraft flies slower, the pilots will pitch the nose of the aircraft upward to increase angle of attack. This will increase the contribution of CL in this equation up until the aircraft stalls. Now what I'm going to do here is plot the same graph, but now with a notch of flaps. What do you think the data will look like? We can see that the line has now shifted upwards as we deploy flaps. This means that for the same angle of attack, CL will now be larger. This is exactly the reason why the wing is able to produce more lift at slower speeds, which in turn allows the stall speed to be reduced. This is because CL max, which corresponds to the stall speed, is now larger in this equation, meaning that velocity can now be smaller for the same amount of lift. This in turn will allow the aircraft to fly slower on the approach. And this is something you can actually test with X-Plane. Here, I'm not using flaps and you can see that the aircraft stalls at 160 knots. But when I use 40 degrees of flap, this reduces all the way down to 123 knots. CL Max is also a really good tool to define how well your flaps are performing. Let's say you wanted to reduce your stall speed by 20% so that you can fly slower on the approach, which also means that you'll need less distance to land, which is the reason we need flaps in the first place. Through algebra, you can then compute the required increase in CL Max to achieve this 20% reduction in stall speed. We call this increase Delta CL Max, where Delta stands for change. Once we know how much CL max needs to increase, we as engineers can then perform calculations to design the optimal flap mechanism to achieve this delta CL max. So for example, here you can see an equation which uses the geometry of the flap to determine how much extra CL will be generated. Another pretty cool thing is that different types of flaps will affect this relationship in different ways. So for example, if you have a plain flap like on the Cessna 172, then the lift curve will look something like this. But if you use a Fowler flap, which is commonly used on airliners, then not only will the lift curve shift upward, but it will also start to rotate. 
This makes the flap way more effective because you can see here that Delta CR Max is now way larger. This has to do with the fact that Fowler flaps not only curve airflow downwards, but they also actually increase the surface area of the wing by extending outward. The ability to make the surface area of the wing larger without curving the air down is super useful for takeoff. During takeoff, we'd like to reduce the stall speed so that we can get into the air faster and not use too much runway. To do this, we again need to increase CL Max through flaps to generate lift at slower speeds. But the difference here is that during takeoff, we'd also like to be able to climb fast, which means we need to be careful with the amount of drag our aircraft is producing. On approach, drag isn't too much of a problem since we're trying to slow the plane down anyways. But on departure, this is a totally different story. Not only do we want to take off in a short distance, but we also want to be able to climb efficiently to avoid any terrain. By making the surface area of the wing bigger, we can reduce the stall speed, but at the same time, avoid any significant drag. If you look at the wing from the front, you'll notice that the cross section is pretty much the same when we deploy the first notches of flaps, even though these are increasing the surface area of the wing. By the way, this is the reason that one of the first things pilots do on a missed approach is raise a couple notches of flaps. In fact, if you're flying a 737, the procedure is to have the pilots call out, go around flaps 15, because it's so important to reduce the amount of drag the flaps are producing. Therefore, it's also one of the first things that pilots will do as they initiate the go-around procedure. Now's also a good time to demonstrate something I was talking about in the previous video. Here we're flying straight and level at a constant speed, preparing for our approach. As I increase the flaps, you'll see that the lift increases for a little bit, but then returns to its original value. What's happening here is that when you suddenly increase CL by shifting these graphs, you get a momentary boost in lift. This will cause the aircraft to climb and can be felt as a kind of ballooning effect. The way pilots react to this is by pushing the nose down, which will reduce the angle of attack and keep the aircraft stabilized on the approach. The best way to learn about this is to watch what's happening in this graph here. Initially, we're flying at this angle of attack and at this CL. But when we deploy flaps, notice how we need to reduce the angle of attack to compensate for this ballooning effect. This is done by pilots pushing forward on the stick and reducing angle of attack. After this initial adjustment, we can then slowly start to reduce the speed of the aircraft. We can do this up until our new CL Max, which is now higher than the previous one because of our flaps. This is exactly the reason why we're going to be able to fly slower on the approach. One last thing which you may find interesting are these structures here. These actually contain the mechanisms that is used to deploy the flaps, such as railings. For older aircraft such as the 747 or the 737-300, these mechanisms were hugely complicated, but they did allow designers to create highly effective flaps. These days, it's no coincidence that flaps are way more simple than the old triple-slotted flaps of the 737-300. By making flaps simpler, maintenance also becomes easier, which is nice, but more importantly, weight is saved. Let's say you make your flap mechanism simpler so that it takes up less of the wing. This will reduce not only the weight of the mechanism itself, but also the main structure of the wing, for which there is now more space available. This means that the wing will need to provide less lift upon landing since the overall weight of the aircraft is now reduced. And because of this, it may even be possible that we can reduce the size of our flaps even further since we don't need to increase CL Max as much as we did before. This process is called the snowball effect, which means that a small change to something important like the flaps can have a dramatic knock-on effect for the design of the rest of the aircraft. It's also the reason why I said in the beginning of the video that flaps are such an important and complex part of an aircraft's design. I think that's a really interesting note to end on, so for now I'd like to thank you very much for watching and I hope to see you again soon.